they, they have what are considered predatory uh, behavior. Um, there is there are two main uh, uh, types of work when it comes to voiceover, union and non-union. Uh, union is uh, the Screen Actors Guild, um, which is the actors' union. Um, uh, any job that's done on a union contract has just that. It's a pre-agreed uh, uh, upon contract that everybody uses. When it's non-union, it doesn't mean it's necessarily bad, but what it means is that it's whatever the employer wants to pay you. So there are plenty of employers out there who do non-union work who are incredibly wonderful, they're, they're nice, they pay you on time, and they're great. There are places out there that are not like that, and it's kind of a wild west. So that's sort of one of these issues that you run into. Most of the stuff on any of these pay-to-play services like Voices.com are non-union. So they can choose to pay you however the heck they want to pay you. So it's kind of a roll of the dice and you have to be careful with that sort of stuff. Um, yes, sir. Well, speaking of roll of the dice, um, I've actually got family that's out in Vegas, going back to the commune question. Um, it's about six hours to drive to LA, so you said that most people usually get a day in advance notice. So that is going to be really tough. Um, uh, yeah, you're talking uh, from if you're you're driving back and forth from Vegas, first of all, it's gonna be hard on you and your car. Um, second, it's going to be, they're probably gonna say no. I have somebody uh, who lives up in kind of Northern California, and they consider that to be too far too. So it's that same time, that's uh, about an eight hour drive right okay. Too far. Um, yeah, yes sir. Uh, so, when you came up yesterday, you mentioned that sometimes you get, you know, as a voice actor, in between jobs, you worry about money and all that kind of stuff. How do, how do the loyalties work with that? Like, do you not constantly get that from previous jobs? So, here's how royalties work. We, uh, we call them residuals. It, it means additional payments that you get paid beyond the original session fee. That's only for union projects. Uh, the union has a whole structure set up that tracks how often something is aired, which is uh, equates to how much money you make. If most of your income is coming from non-union stuff, you will never see a dime in terms of royalties, residuals, or anything like that because there is no body uh, that is out there keeping track of everything for you. You would have to do that all on your own and you would have to negotiate a very special contract with that company and either trust them that they would actually pay you fairly, which is most companies don't want to spend money, they don't have to, uh, and uh, they will probably just not do that. They'll probably just say, sorry, it's a one-time fee and we own this and we can do whatever the heck we want to do with this audio file. Um, and that's. That's kind of one of the, it's it's difficult to join the union, but there's a lot of perks, but at the same time, there's also a lot of non-union work out there that maybe you might find interesting and want to take part in. So uh, most people, when it comes to union stuff, they wait until they're actually living in like Los Angeles specifically, because that's where the major hub of union work is, and they'll, actually, they'll get to a point where they feel like, all right, I'm working enough that I don't need to do any non-union stuff anymore. I can, I can start doing only union stuff and join the union. How's the union in New York City? Um, the union does not have such a strong grip in New York City. Uh, most of the voiceover work there is, well, the animation voiceover work there is mm -hmm. not union. Um, they also do a lot of commercials out in uh, New York. New York is really big for promos and commercials. That's mostly union stuff. So you can have, for instance, a an agent in New York uh, that will send you out for a lot of union stuff and then has a strong grip there, but it's going to be mostly commercials. Uh, my agency is CESD. Uh, they have both a New York branch and an LA branch. Um, one of our uh, LA talent had to go to New York and it scared the heck out of everybody over there because they'd never heard anybody do a cartoon uh, read before. And, and had a bunch of screaming and yelling in the booth and everybody in the screen. What is that? <laughs> That's totally common for like a, a widely animated series. So over there, it's mostly film was a Yeah, Tech House is a, an interesting thing. They actually do a lot of recording in Los Angeles too. So it's, that's kind of a bi coastal sort of situation, but it's, yes, sir. Uh, do you know anything about getting into voice acting for audiobooks? Voice acting for audiobooks is interesting. Um, first of all, it is more or less the most advanced form of home recording that there is. Um, this is where you need a very good microphone. You probably need a professional grade voiceover recording booth. And you're probably looking at Audible right now. Audible is like the biggest source of uh, voiceover jobs out there for uh, uh, audiobooks, but I'm gonna be honest with you, I've never done an audiobook before. I'm probably not the best person to answer that question. Uh, the number one thing that you're gonna have to consider for that though is how much you're willing to spend on the technology itself to uh, get behind that because you're 
competition are all going to be using professional studio-grade microphones and studio-grade recording environments to stand out uh, best they possibly can and have the most professional sound they can. Uh, yes? Yeah. I just wanted to go back to the union versus non-union. Um, <clears throat> once you're in, uh, in the union, it seems like you're pretty well protected, but if you're doing, like you said, taking care of everything yourself, non-union contracts, advisable to have legal retainer, legal counsel, somebody who can sort of mediate the contracts, or you expect to just learn that on your own and take care of that? Uh, when it comes to non-union stuff, you're expected to more or less learn it on your own. Mm -hmm. uh, you're basically at the mercy of whoever hires you, because most voice actors, I'm going to be real with you, we don't read the contract. We just get told, <laughs> uh, it's going to pay blank dollars an hour with a blank hour minimum. Uh, if you agree with that, write that down and, and just write your name here, here, and here. We go, oh, oh yeah, yeah, thanks, thanks much for the job, so I'll go work. And that's it. Uh, but like, and then it turns out you sign away your first tour because technically speaking, they can write anything they want into a contract, and they're not doing anything wrong because it's not union. There's it's their own personal contract that each studio has that they'll have you sign. Uh, yes. Well, what's uh, your uh, end game for like when you plan to hire? Do you plan just to do this until uh, you're in the ground, or do you see do you see <laughs> Me, personally, uh, until I drop dead. I want to be like Jude Foray, like just like working into my 90s. I love it. But there are definitely people out there who are like, yeah, I kind of want to retire. I, I do most of, I just so much screaming and yelling, I can't do that anymore. I kind of want to have an end game and be out. Um, for that, there are retirement plans. Again, though, it's only for reunion stuff. So uh, that's all based on how much union work you've been doing. Um, there are benefits to joining the union. There are negatives to joining the union. Most people wind up getting there once they've actually gotten to a place in their career where they feel uh, solidly like they can do this uh, for a living. And it, it, it's, it's about when you feel like you're really ready to join, that's when you can pull it off. Yes? I wasn't here uh, uh, for this part. Um, where would you say uh, would be the best place to start uh, for a joining the union? Okay, here's, here's how joining the union works. It's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> What everybody will say is, you'll get it, you'll figure it out, don't worry, you'll find a way in. Um, there are a whole bunch of misconceptions about what it takes to get into the Screen Actors Guild. Um, one of them is uh, that it costs um, the producers money. Um, it technically doesn't. It's called the tact partly process. And what that means is a producer uh, signs a contract with the union to make their project a union project. And uh, what they think that that means is they can only hire people who are already in the union. They don't have to do that. They can, in fact, hire somebody who is non-union and tap them into the union. It doesn't cost the producers any money, uh, but a lot of them think it does. And it, they're completely and totally wrong about that. It's totally free for them. Um, uh, they sign it with just additional paperwork. That means, hey, uh, I hired a, what's, what's your name? Matt. Um, Matt? Matt. Oh, Matt. Uh, I hired this guy named Matt, he's a great actor, he's non-union, um, I want him in my game. And they say, okay, fill up these two pieces of paperwork. That's really all it takes. But there are companies out there that just don't want to deal with that. And it becomes very, very frustrating uh, when you are a non-union actor and you're trying to join. But let's say you get that union audition, you book that union role, all you need is to take your pay stubs and you take them in to the Screen Actors Guild. They have like a section uh, of their uh, their offices that you just go in and you say, here's my pay stubs because I worked on this union project, I want to join. Now the problem is, uh, after SAG, which was the Screen Actors Guild, and AFTRA, which I don't even want to try to remember what the heck that's good for, they both these two were different <coughs> acting unions and they merged to form SAG-AFTRA. When that happened, the rate of joining the union went up by a lot, and now it costs around 3,000 bucks to join. So it's a ton of money to get in. They have a payment plan that <coughs> only $500 a month for six months, but that's still a ton of money. And if you live in Los Angeles, you are gonna be going through money very, very, very quickly. Prices, like housing prices, are insane in Los Angeles. It's very tough to pull it off. Um, but, yes, ma'am. Uh, what was the first voice role you ever did? Oh, the first voice role I ever did? Oh, it would've probably been a, a radio commercial for like Del Taco. Would've been something like that. Uh, uh, yes. Yes. So um, a demo reel, for those of you guys who don't know, it's going to be, it used to be literally tape. Now it's uh, an MP3 that you send out. There are going to be multiple types of demo reels. Your demo reel can be uh, for, um, say, commercials. It'll, it's just going to be you doing a bunch of different uh, radio spots or television spots. There's going to be an interactive one, which is for video games. They're going more cinematic now with video games. That's the trend. 
So it'll be lots of very like realistic, believable, on-camera-esque uh, performances. There's your animation demo reel, which is going to be super zany and cartoony and shows how much vocal range you have and how much performance range you have, et cetera, et cetera. Those are usually the, the three main ones, though. Some people will combine the uh, uh, interactive one and the, on and the uh, uh, animation one into one and just have two. Uh, some people just have one, uh, and that's about all they, that's really what their focus is. Um, demo reels, though, are not going to do the work for you because, unfortunately, uh, demo reel is something that kind of everybody who's trying to be a voice actor ultimately winds up having, and it all kind of starts sounding sort of samey. So anything that you can do to make yours stand out goes a, a really, really long way. But yes, they are important. They're basically your calling card. It's like a, a, a business here might have like a business card. <coughs> demo reel is the voice actor's business card. So SAG AFTRA is the uh, the union, um, and the the, uh, the trouble is uh, there's no solid answer for your second question. Every single thing is super individual basic. Um, like for instance, I will say this: keep impressions completely off of your demo reel no, if you can. No, I know, no impressions. Yes, no impressions. Uh, there is there's basically two impressions that everybody does, and it, as soon as people hear it, they immediately tune out. Christopher Walken is one of them. Everybody's got a Walken. Don't ever do it. Don't ever put it on your demo reel anywhere. You'll get shot down so fast, you'll make your head spin. And uh, the other one is Sean Connery. Both of those two. If you've got them, don't do it. I've heard, I've heard women who can actually do a really solid one of each one of those. So literally everybody can do it. Nobody's impressed by it. Um, yes, sir? Uh, for the demo reel, if you wanted to do like better to like find actual advertisements and just copy the script or just make something up and do something original? Um, for specifically for commercial copy, commercial commercials that are already there, totally fine. Uh, nobody's going to get mad about that. Um, uh, the only thing would be if you are already an actor and you received an audition for one of those things, don't use that script because that is an unreleased product and you can get in trouble for that. But if you just saw like a commercial that's already on the air and you just adapted what you just pause it, write down what they say, unpause it, pause it, write down what they say, that's usually fine. Especially if it's something that you feel really suits your voice. That, that works, uh, no problem. Nobody's going to get mad about that. Yes? Me? Yes? Why is it someone like Gilbert Gottfried? What about somebody like Gilbert Gottfried? Um, again, no. Like, don't, don't do impressions. Uh, because one, one thing we'll see is that you, unless, here's the deal. If you are a voice matching specialist and there are people out there, uh, that's different. You can have a voice match reel where you do really solid celebrity impressions, but keep that completely separate from everything else. That is its own category. Uh, there are people out there who are wildly talented. Um, uh, there is somebody, I've, I've got to work with his name is uh, uh, Piot Michael. Uh, Piot is insane. Like his walk-in, he does two. He does one that's like, here's the walking impression everybody does. Here's what he actually sounds like. <clears throat> and they're different. And you, you listen to what he actually sounds like. And then you watch an interview and go, oh my god, that just sounds like the guy talking. Whoa. So there are already people out there who are wildly talented at impressions. Unless yours is absolutely spot on, don't do it. However, that being said, a bad impression of somebody else, especially a really bad impression, is its own original character voice. So you can always go, all right. This was an awful impression, but if I just kind of tweak it, I can turn it into its own thing. And now it's my voice, and nobody can say I'm a bad impression. Just say, I'm not doing an impression of Donald Duck. That's just what I. That's just what I think he should sound like. It's my own character. <laughs> Daniel Duck. Can I just say it's like Kevin Godfrey's stupid cousin Jimmy? <laughs> I would just stick right away from any reference to Gilbert Godfrey. <laughs> <laughs> just, just do your own thing. <laughs> nice. Yes, so if you're doing our original animation demo reel, write your own stuff. That's usually the best way to go. Uh, unfortunately, some places that do professional demo works, you can kind of tell because they'll use the same copy and they'll have you'll have you'll hear the exact same dialogue being used in other people's demo reels, and then yours winds up sounding a lot like everybody else's. So if you want to uh, make that if you want to do that, you can totally make your own, uh, with your own ideas and your own dialogue. Uh, when it comes to making a professional demo reel, and by professional, I mean 
it's one where you go to a recording facility, you work with a demo producer, and you are probably going to spend literally thousands of dollars on this thing. You only, only do that when you are really, really ready. That is not something you want to do fresh out the gate. If you want to have a demo reel just to show people, here's what I can do so far, that's fine, but like, make it at, at home by yourself and do your own little thing and have a good time. Don't spend a ton of money on it. Don't make yourself bankrupt. Only when you're really, really, truly ready to go for it do you want to spend that kind of bank and go for a professional uh, demo reel. Yes? So do you have any tips um, okay. for protecting your voice? For example, I have a, just for a project of my own, I have two characters, and I have to do one first, and then the second one because the other one kills my voice. Mm -hmm. And if I need to re-record, I can't go back because it's too late, i got to wait like a day. Is there anything that you do to like kind of help with that? So there's no magical cure. Um, there is what we call Hulk juice. Um, it is, I believe it's called Nin Jong Pei Pa Kwa. It is actually um, Chinese cough syrup, but it's like all natural. Um, uh, it has become very popular in recording studios because it basically coats uh, your throat to kind of add a little extra layer of protection from all the screaming. Uh, we call it Hulk juice because Brad Tadashor, uh, who plays the Incredible Hulk and does a ton of yelling, uh, would just be downing this stuff all the time. <laughs> so there are some things that you can do, but there is no magical tonic that's just gonna like protect you. Um, one of the things that you'll learn if you're a singer is like the correct way to project without hurting yourself. Right. As a voice actor, you're gonna kind of wanna do the opposite of that because most of our performances are, here's what a real person would sound like if they're yelling at the top of their lungs. And yes, that's what it is. Uh, can you by any chance spell that? Uh, well, I can, I can, I, I only know the Chinese name in Chinese. Oh, how does it actually pronounced? Uh, me and Quan Bei Pi Pa Gao. Okay, so. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. That's how yeah. We call it Nim So if you ever hear somebody saying, uh, yeah, give me some of that Nim Jom, that's what we're actually talking about. That's what I'm to pronounce it. So, I wish I could have recorded that. It would have been nice to be like, guys, this is how you actually say it. <laughs> yes, that is the stuff. <laughs> Yes, uh, tea uh, with honey. Uh, sometimes uh, ginger is fine too, but like usually tea with honey uh, is the other thing that people will drink. Um, you want to avoid any kind of cold beverages, any kind of hot beverages. So like that tea, let it cool down a little bit. That uh, water, make it room temperature. And that's because uh, it causes constriction and expansion of the vocal cords, kind of like hot and cold weather will expand and contract. 